and welcome to Noclip, the podcast about video games and the people who make them. On today's episode, we talk about how a quarter of the Earth's population became video games' bad guys. Representation is an important part of any media landscape. As a kid growing up in Ireland, I can attest to the power of seeing your culture represented in a piece of global media. I remember the joy of hearing Atlas's Irish accent in Bioshock, or that of Shea Patrick Cormac in Assassin's Creed Rogue. The flip side of this, of course, are the stereotypes, the drunken Irish louts and the mercenary terrorists that have represented Irish people in films, games and literature throughout my childhood. Thankfully, these days, those associations are considered lazy writing, but sadly not every group of people are afforded such creative understanding. A few months ago, I came across an interesting Twitter thread involving indie developer Rami Ismail. In it, he described how contemporary games still seem to struggle with the basics of writing Arabic, resulting in, at best, a horrific break of immersion as words are written backwards or with letters unconnected, and at worst, an insulting disregard for a language spoken by over 400 million people. Rami understands this from both a cultural and developer perspective. As co-founder of Lambir, he has worked on numerous successful indie titles including Nuclear Throne, Ridiculous Fishing, Super Crate Box, and Luftrousers. So how is it that films and games still manage to get so much wrong when it comes to depicting Arabs, Muslims, or Islamic culture? There's a lot to talk about here, how media reflects our stereotypes, how fiction reflects the world as we see it and not really how it is, and even how code itself can contain racial biases. To get to the bottom of it all, I called Rami up on Skype to talk about how Islam and Arabs are portrayed in games and the steps that developers can make to make games more accurate and to buck troubling stereotypes. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm Rami Ismail. I'm a Dutch Egyptian game developer. I spend a lot of my time traveling around the world, uh, working with game developers everywhere to uh, advance the games industry in their respective countries. And in doing that, I've, I've gotten to learn a lot about the cultural impact of games and the way games reflect on culture and represent culture. And that's always sort of been an interesting uh, story in my life. I grew up uh, as a child of a Dutch mother and an Egyptian father, which are two uh, quite uh, divergent cultures to grow up between. So I've always felt a little bit of a, of a third culture kid. And I started traveling, um, started traveling around the world, um, started meeting other developers and starting to learn about this games industry. And it was really only then that um, I really realized just how, how much media shapes your view of the world, because despite being uh, Egyptian, I, you know, I kind of internalized that Arabs are the bad guys in a lot of media and that that is fine for some reason. Um, and then when I started traveling and I started to, to look around the world and realizing that it actually isn't fine that I started seeing just how how ubiquitous this is, this idea of like, you know, the, our, our people are the good people and the other people are the bad people. And as soon as I started looking at it through that lens, I, I obviously was a little shocked because I, I went back to games that I loved in my childhood and just started looking at the representation of Arabs, games as old as like the arcade title Metal Slug, which is what, 20, 25 years old by now? Um, and just realizing that we've kind of been the bad guys in media all along. And, and obviously it like shifted. There's been a period of times where there's Nazis, periods of time where it's the Russians or the Soviets, periods of time where it's the South Americans, but um, it's never, you know, it's never the Western world. And then, you know, you start looking around and you start, you start thinking like, okay, well, what do I know about my, my Egyptian family? What do I know about my Egyptian friends? Like, how do they feel about it? And, it just kind of internalizes, right? You just kind of get used to this idea of, well, I guess we're the bad, we're the bad guys. It's weird knowing that kids in the Middle East and kids around the world are growing up with this idea of, oh yeah, we're the bad guy. Like we're supposed to shoot us, right? Like shoot people that look like my parents. That's interesting to me because obviously you grew up in a sort of, you know, in, in the Netherlands, I'm assuming, especially because it's English speaking stuff is so prevalent. There's probably a lot more 
sort of American and British media shown there than perhaps in a lot of other European countries. Um, but you're even saying like like relatives of yours that grew up in the Middle East, it's the same thing. Yeah, no. no when you, when you think about it, uh, Hollywood and and the games industry. Uh, they are Western media, and in, in many ways, they represent a Western view of what is right and wrong, what is morally acceptable, what is morally unacceptable, who is good and who is evil. Um, and a lot of that media still makes it across. Like uh, the, the movies that uh, people watch in the Arab world are not, they're not different movies. Yes, there's obviously Arab cinema, um, but that doesn't exclude. Um, it doesn't exclude Western cinema from being played there. Like they watch the same Avengers movies. And yes, there's sometimes there's modification, sometimes, you know, certain ideas about what is acceptable in a, in, in a cinema, uh, you know, make changes to a movie. Um, when I was a kid, I would watch uh, movies in an Arab cinema and then miss plot points because those plot points happen during um, um, the, what's the polite way of saying it, like a romantic scene in a movie right. um, uh, that contained too much nudity for Arab audiences in those days. And like, you know, like the, the movies were edited for content, but uh, in essence, they were the same, the same movies and uh, nobody really cut out Arabs being blown up in a movie. That, that that was acceptable. Uh, you know, the same double standard we have in the West, violence is okay, and sexuality is very much not. That same standard exists in the Arab world. So, so you know, they're not that dissimilar, and they're consuming a lot of the same media, uh, which means that they're also accepting a lot of the same messaging, and that's, um, you know, a, a little concerning. The sort of pastiche of the Arab terrorist, uh, which persisted in the 90s, is it is it fair to say that that sort of, you know, uh, turned turned a little bit more evil or or had a more i don't know like spiteful edge to it in a in a post 911 sort of media landscape yeah absolutely and i i think it's also just a, a more common trope now uh, i i mean every every era has every every part of the western era has its its uh prevalent enemy culture right and for a while after 911 uh, that was considered the the extremist muslims uh which you know, Muslims are all over the world. Um, they're one of the largest demographics on the planet. Uh, they, they live as far as Indonesia, all the way down to Central Africa. Um, there's Muslim there's Muslim countries everywhere. But really, instead of doing Muslim extremists, a lot of people just defaulted to Arab, and they're not very good at that either. Like. If you look in movies, if you look in games, if you look in media at large, what is Arab is often conflated and mixed up. A lot of times Persian cultures that don't speak Arabic get represented. Uh, get, they use elements from those cultures to represent Arabs, even though they are not necessarily Arabs. Uh, not all Muslims are Arabs. Not all Arabs are Muslim. Uh, but, you know, for ease of stereotyping, they get represented in that way. Uh, similar to, you know, how, uh, and, and I've started, me and friends have started to call this Arabistan, uh, this like sort of like fictional Arab country in which everybody lives in a little desert village that is dusty with small stone houses and everybody, like all the women are like very thickly veiled and all the guys are like in the back of Jeeps with AK-47s with like beards and turbans, like that country does not exist. There is no place like that. And like, you will see a television series that will say like Beirut and show that while Beirut in reality is like a huge, like this huge metropolitan city that, you know, if you would take a photo of uh, an average street, you wouldn't be able to tell it apart from London or, or, or any other like major city. But that's not, that's not what people are selling. What they're selling, what these series are selling is a confirmation of a stereotype. People think that that's what the Arab world looks like. So if you do a scene in Beirut and it looks like a city, people won't believe it. So in a way, it's it's keeping itself like it's perpetu it's self perpetuating. This speaks to something that happens um, probably to every foreign culture when they're viewed in the media. But there's something about the specific sort of laziness I feel like when it comes to the Middle East in particular, considering probably especially that it is such a melting pot of, of different types of uh, culture and ethnicity and everything else, um, 
that that happened like i remember i could imagine getting frustrated about people not knowing where ireland is right like americans not knowing where ireland is but that's not really that big a deal or you know the aurora borealis was in street fighter 3 when they were in 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 england and i remember thinking what the fuck's that about that's that's ridiculous <laughs> but 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 why why is there such like pa- painting with a broad brush is sort of something that happens a lot yeah. but it does seem like the brush is much broader when it comes to the middle east like why do you think that is do you think it's because people know that the audience is kind of not clued in or that they they think that a western audience doesn't really care and they don't really care about the audience that it might actually be, be from that place yeah i think i think it's it's mostly the second thing uh, there's no for for a lot of a lot of western media there's no particular appeal in appealing to arab audiences even though the middle east is one of the fastest developing regions in the world and it's not a poor region it's a relatively rich region as well uh, it, it just it has only st- only recently have people started to uh, look at the region as like a, an actual uh, place of people. Right. And like it's sad that this has to be an economical function rather than like a moral function that people would just get it right. Because if you make a movie that includes a certain culture, you should represent it well. But being Dutch, like I know, like the Netherlands gets represented as like speaking German in movies very frequently. Like that's just a thing, right? Like scenes that are supposed to be in Amsterdam are shot in like Berlin. And that's in the Netherlands, that's common. But the thing is, that's not it's not a it's not a misrepresentation of who the people are as a people. It's just the wrong place. They're still represented as like positive, friendly, you know, kind of European um, you know, kind of quaint people, which fair enough for the Netherlands, like I, I can see how that works. But for Arabs, we're often uh, stereotyped as like aggressive, as angry, as evil, uh, as plotting and scheming, like the amount of, as a game developer, like I love the medium of video games, but um, if I if I have to name you like five Arab protagonist characters or not even active protagonists, not a, a player character, not like a main protagonist, but even a fellow protagonist or a secondary character, I could I could maybe name you two just off the top of my head. And I've researched this, obviously. Like, there's just not a lot of characters like that. I remember playing uh, Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, and there was a scene in that where you're in Cairo, like future Cairo, and there's a, a rebellion that is fighting alongside you. And I was just, I was so excited that these Egyptians, these, these country, these fellow countrymen of mine uh, were fighting on the good side. And just, you know, I was elated. Like, I was so happy that this was a scene in a game. And then obviously they betray you later on because no Arab can be that trustworthy in a video game, apparently. And it just broke my heart, right? Like, it's one of those moments where you're like, even that moment of like, oh, these people are fine. Like, they're also fighting for good like they it it just wasn't a thing like that they had to betray you for that character to make sense to the writers or to the developers or the creators and it's it's incredibly sad when you think of that and that 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 is the message that's being perpetuated while at the same time a lot of movies tv series games don't even take the time to get the language right or to take the environment right to place cities in the right countries or to even like make them somewhat believable. Uh, there's just an incredible laziness to which uh, Arabs are used as, as antagonists that is somewhat similar to how a lot of uh, old movies use Nazis in, as antagonists. And like, honestly, when it comes to Nazis, you know, the, fair enough. Like the Nazi, the Nazi Reich did horrible things and their ideology as a group, which was not a huge group, but like as a group was evil. And I think we all agree about that. And there's no, no real discussion about it. But you can't really say that about Arabs. The difference between a Lebanese person who is very like the Lebanese tend to be very Western, uh, very progressive, very Western focused and like very modern in that regard and like somebody in saudi arabia which is more strict more islam like more islamic more muslim focused you know like they're both arabs there's no like consistent evil arabs there like they're not nazis so do you do you think that media sort of as as the years progressed and nazis became less and less relevant that there was a sort of a nazi shaped hole left in in i guess tropes and then essentially middle eastern people just kind of filled it well yeah that and and the soviets right like it was the russian 
Russians or the Arabs, and then eventually the Russians weren't that scary anymore because they haven't really caused war for a long time. So uh, for a while they tried the Chinese, but China controls a lot of media nowadays as well, so that doesn't really fly either. So the Arabs are left. The Arabs don't have a lot of influence on the world stage. They don't. Um, there have been uh, incidents and wars in the region, often not caused by the people there, but you know wars that happen to them. But regardless, war. Uh, there is absolutely an extremist part of the Arab world or the Muslim world. Um, yes, there has been terrorism in the region. Absolutely. But and when you think about it, most of the victims of that type of terrorism, terrorism have been people that live there, right? They live under this terror, like under terrorist um, uh, groups or in ter terrorist territory. And the people most affected are the local people there. And they're also Arab, uh, sometimes also Muslim. Uh, so, so when you think about it, the the media needs a boogeyman. It needs an evil that we can all agree on is evil. And the thing is, for Arabs, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's the most visceral thing that can represent evil to a lot of people. And part of that is self-perpetuating. Part of that started with 9-11, but then um, as things went, as things changed, it never corrected to being a, a truthful representation of the world. And instead, we're still watching... TV series in which Beirut is a sandy village full of people with AK-47s. When you think about the games that sort of stand out from this awful stereotype, the games that sort of maybe didn't get everything right, but did something right, like what are some examples um, that you have? What comes to mind for me as somebody who I have barely been to the Middle East, I've only ever been to um, uh, the various cities in the Emirates, which is, is its own culture as well. Um, but to me the only one that sort of struck any sort of accord seems to be uh um the first assassin's creed game although that was largely in sort of christian israeli areas um but what 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 are the ones is that a good example or is that an example that through my western eyes looks accurate but actually through more accurate eyes is not well i mean uh, obviously altair who was the, the main character of assassin's creed like i remember playing that game and just realizing that my arab was useful here Right, like understanding Arab made a difference because Al Mu'allim, which is one of the main characters in, in the game, just means the wise one. Right, like Altair means the flying one. Altair ibn al Ahad, which was the full character of the, the full name of the main character in that game, means Altair, the son of no one. Like, I, I understand these things before the game would explain them. And that was, it was a phenomenal feeling. It was great. It, it just, just realizing that this part of my culture, even though it wasn't. Uh, Egyptian per se, but like part of the Levantian region, that this was taken seriously uh, was was incredible. Um, uh, also, Assassin's Creed Origins, the most recent version of the game, is technically about ancient Egypt, but like most Assassin's Creed games, there is a, um, a contemporary element to the games. Um, and in this case, it takes place in Egypt with an Egyptian main character. Uh, and uh, she is a phenomenal character, uh, westernized, but a modern westernized, but clearly of Arab heritage uh, person. Uh, there's a moment where she curses in the game and she does it in Egyptian um, and like in the right accent, with the right tone, with the right Egyptian like, you know, words. And it, it feels very, it felt very nice. It felt like a little wing to the people that are Egyptian or Arab uh, that would recognize that. Uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution had a, uh, a female Arab character in the game, and she wasn't a protagonist, but she was a trustworthy, reliable person. Call of Duty Infinite Warfare had a Lebanese soldier that she as well was uh, a dependable, a trustworthy person uh, that plays a major role in the story. Overwatch has two Arab characters that are actually uh, really good, uh, Farah and Anna, and both of them are fully realized uh, Egyptian characters as well. But the amount of times you actually take control of a fully Arab kind of contemporary person, I, I don't think I could name you any at the moment.
where do you think the impetus is to getting this stuff right? Is it a mixture of um, more Arab people being involved in development? Or is it the fear that Rami Ishmael will get on Twitter and start giving out to people? Or is it uh, the developing audience within that marketplace? Or, or is it just that games generally are being held to a higher cultural standard than they were 15 years ago? What do you think? I think I think it's a little bit of all of it. Um, I don't think my Twitter is that big of a deal in, in the whole story, <laughs> but... Uh, obviously, people giving attention to an issue or like pointing out that something is an issue makes people look at it and reconsider just how uh, sloppily this is handled. And, and I'm, I'm, when I say sloppily, that's not an exaggeration. Again, in, in many games, Arabic is a, a beautiful script written from right to left. It's cursive, so all the letters are connected. The amount of games in which, um, or even movies, like uh, movies like um captain america civil war or games like battlefield uh these giant titles often just get arabic wrong it's it's not written properly it's the the right words written backwards uh with no letters connected something that any arab if any arab had looked at this these these scenes or these moments in these uh, in these media expressions they would have immediately said well that's wrong we should fix it um but that doesn't happen because the representation of, of these people, the, the attendance of these people in, in the creative uh, process is just very low at the moment. We're not represented well because we're not, we don't have access to these creative processes very often. And that's changing. In the last few years, there has been, been an increasing amount of Arabs that have uh, joined the games industry or that have gotten in positions of more influence in the games industry. At the same time, the market in the Middle East is growing, uh, where a decade ago, two decades ago, a lot of games that you would buy in the region because of the economical differences between the West and uh, Egypt would be pirated copies. You would go to a store, you would buy a pirated version of FIFA 2001, and it would come pre-installed with a, with a crack that would allow you to play this pirated copy on the disc, right? Uh, but now that the economy is sort of like shifting and the world is globalizing, a lot of uh, a lot of Arab countries also just buy legal games. The digital revolution obviously helps a lot there. Uh, so people have way broader access to games and now than ever before. And it also means that the market there has grown. And then finally, like you said, I think games are being held to higher cultural standards too. I think as the medium is maturing and as uh, games are becoming a broader and broader part of the global conversation, of the global awareness, of the global consciousness. Um, not just the creators feel an increased responsibility to represent the world well, or even their fictional worlds well, to not take shortcuts uh, when they can avoid it and to not take harmful shortcuts under any circumstance. Um, at the same time, the audiences are more critical of the media they consume. Um, and they're not as happy to just be like, yeah, of course, like the Arabs are the bad guys. Clearly, like they, they just evil that is just evil is less and less accepted in our media. And if there is somebody evil, we like to have a justification. Like, why is our protagonist fighting this person? What brought this person to be that? And you see that in big blockbuster movies like Avengers Infinity War, in which the antagonist is basically the main character in the movie. But you also see it in some of the um, some of the stereotypes in other places uh, where even if you are an Arab, that doesn't make you evil. There's a separate thing, a separate like inciting incident that puts the character on a on a certain trajectory. And I that makes me hopeful because that's honestly a way more true version of the world. Like people aren't evil because they, they are of a certain race or heritage or country or ideology. They are. They do bad things because they believe that is the best course of action for them or their family or their life or their their people. And that, that holds true for, for honestly most things in the world. Like people are not evil because they're Arab. They might be evil despite being Arab. Uh, most Arabs I know are pretty much all Arabs I know, honestly, are, are tremendous, welcoming, warm, hospitable people that you meet them and they will invite you for dinner the same day.
this reminds me a little bit of when I was talking to Seda Project about how so many of the games that were coming from, um, I guess, across the Iron Curtain at that stage and then later once they joined um, or once once the wall had fallen down, that there was a big sort of culture of localization happening um, there along with that pirate scene. Was Is there any sense of that at all in, in the Middle East that like some of these big blockbuster games were getting some sort of like localization treatment? Yeah, no, it makes a huge difference. Until recently, the f- three games that were ever translated into Arab were uh, FIFA, Pro Evolution Soccer, and for some reason, Wally. <laughs> I have no reason why Wally, but Wally had Arab localization. But more recently, uh, a lot more games have had Arab localization, and it's frequently not Arab voice acting. That's still pretty rare. But a lot of games at least have Arab menus. They have menus that are displayed properly from the right to the left instead of the left to the right, like they invert their UI. Right. Uh, the Division had that. I think Horizon Zero Dawn had Arabic. Like the, A lot of blockbusters are starting to take the market seriously, which means that in return, the market starts taking these games as products made for them instead of things you just download from the internet illegally because it's not for you anyway. And that's that's honestly, it, it, it marks a huge shift. It, it's an important moment, I think, uh, in that a lot of these major platforms and a lot of these creators are realizing that there are people out there that are interested in their media. Uh, all they need is just, you know, to feel like they are respected, even the tiniest bit. And they're, you know, instead of being, instead of the, the, the bullet point on the game that refers to Arabs being, well, now if you blow up the card, the Arab guy that's next to it will fly away with more spectacular ragdolls. Like, instead of that, saying like, hey, we see you as a people, we see you as a person, and we think you deserve the same level as respect and attention, the localization, the culturalization that all these other cultures have. And that, you know, it, it just means, even though it, nobody will consciously be able to, to word or to put into words that difference, um, it is huge. It is night and day. How, what are the, like, for, as somebody who understands games production, what are the ways in which this sort of gets solved is it just a case of having more arab people on staff is it a case of um yeah i don't know like is this something that just takes time or is there some more immediate way that like because we have a lot of developers that listen to our stuff as well like is there any like best cases or any stuff that that can help fix this issue obviously if you're going to represent arabic culture uh, you have to think very careful about what arabic culture means because egyptian culture is extraordinarily different from the culture in um say saudi arabia which is different from the culture in lebanon which is different from the culture the culture in syria which is different from the culture. like every one of these countries is its own culture uh the same way you wouldn't get away with representing california as say montana or you wouldn't get away with representing london as dublin right like they are different cultures even though they have a lot of com- in common they sometimes speak the same language they might have accents um thinking of arabs as one thing is already a problem the same way thinking of arabic as one language is incorrect the easiest way to get that right is obviously if you're doing something in the arabic world have arabs look at it have arabs confirm it and don't just have them confirm it at the start but have them confirm it at every stage through the process the main reason for that is that computers are actually terrible at arabic their devices made to deal with the english language which is written from left to right as individual characters, while Arabic is written right to left as a cursive script, so the letters have to be connected. Computers were never built to do that. No computer was ever built to deal with a cursive script or a script that is connected. So the way Arabic works in computers is technically kind of a hack. And uh, until 2017, even Word, Excel, and PowerPoint didn't properly support Arabic. That is a, a relatively recent addition to the office suite of programs is proper Arabic support. Which means that until 2017, if you copy pasted an Arabic sentence from Word to PowerPoint, it would break. That's that seems that seems incredible in 2017 for that to be an issue. Yeah, this was like a big update: Arabic support in Office. Um, But that is still true for a lot of software that Arabic breaks. And one of the pieces of software is a commonly used uh, creative tool, uh, Photoshop, 
um, which still does not support Arabic properly. So, you know, in, in a game production or a movie production, often what will happen is um, they will have English text. They will ask for it to be translated. The translation company will send back a translated file. And then the artists or the creatives that work with it copy paste from that file to their uh, to their programs or software or whatever they're using. And then it breaks, but they don't notice because they don't understand the language, right? So they don't notice that the text is broken or inverted or that the letters are no longer connected because as far as they're aware, copy paste always works. So having Arabs involved in every pro step of this process and not just Arabs, preferably Arabs from the region you're representing is a huge difference. Then the second thing is like, obviously the Arab region is full of mythology and history and culture and music, art, stuff like that. And it's very easy to, to base a fictional culture on that. If you do that, it might be worthwhile trying to think of anything more interesting than it is a place with sand in which everything is terrible. Um, Overwatch did a really beautiful map of, uh, I forgot which country it was, I think Iraq. And in that map, it's displayed as this beautiful city full of like green and glass tall towers and like this positive um, view of the future. I know just that, just the representation as something else than a forgotten part of the world uh, would mean a lot. So when people think of creating a, a space, a fictional or realistic space in the Arab world, you know, make sure they involve Arabs. Uh, try to think of anything but uh, this is where the terrorists live and try to think of it as like a, a place that has aspirations, hopes that that is trying to, you know, given the a lot of the, the messed up history there, whether it's messed up from like colonialism or messed up from invasions or messed up from war or messed up from corruption or political problems, like whatever the reason is, a lot of these territories have um, issues that they're desperately trying to fix. They have a youth that is so hopeful for the future that wants things to be better that is willing to uh you know go on the streets and protest to to cause revolutions to to try and make the world better that you know like back them up like give them something to believe in give them a future to believe in and make them make them feel heard make them feel valuable like if if anything isn't that what games and media should be about like showing us a mirror of the world that sometimes shows us what is bad, but also sometimes shows us what is good. Like there's an entire people out there that the only mirror they've ever had shows them as terrorists. And that's incredibly sad to me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Noclip Podcast. If you don't already, you can follow Rami on Twitter at the underscore Rami. That's T-H-A underscore R-A-M-I. Thanks so much to him for taking the time to talk to us. I believe he took the call from a hallway of a games convention in, I want to say it was Croatia. It was a few months ago now, so I can't quite remember. I'd also like to wish you a happy new year and tell you that we're actually going to be changing the format of this podcast quite a bit in 2019. As you can probably tell from this episode, I'm stripping out some of the more time-intensive editing techniques that I used in previous episodes to basically try and get more of these out there. In fact, instead of this being a sort of edited, curated type of show, we're going to do it more conversational, more like a lot of podcasts out there, but instead of it being a you know collection of people who talk every week, we're going to talk to a new person within this sort of massive global sphere of games uh, every episode. So that might be a developer, it might be somebody who works in the press, it might be somebody who's actually not involved in games but has a completely other interesting facet of their life and also plays games. As it turns out, we have a sort of a massive document full of people who are super interested and down to do this. Um, and if I just did these recorded, edited interviews like this, I'd never get around to doing them. So what we're going to do is essentially make this a more conversational uh, type of podcast. And then every once in a while do these, you know, curated, highly edited episodes as sort of like special stories every once in a while. 
The next one of those you're going to hear will be an interview with Jeff Gersman I conducted about the 10 year anniversary of Giant Bomb and his history of working in the games press. But aside from that, the rest of the podcasts you're going to hear on this feed are going to be less edited and more frequent. The plan is to make this a weekly show some stage in 2019, but we're going to sort of ramp up to it a little bit slowly. If that sounds like a good idea to you or a terrible one, let me know. I'm at Danny O'Dwyer on Twitter. As ever, thank you to our incredible patrons for supporting our work. You can support our documentaries, this podcast, and more by joining up on patreon.com slash noclip. You'd also get access to this podcast early via a special or essay feed not to mention all the other goodies we give out uh, on the patreon every week thank you so much for supporting our show i'm very excited to take it into new and interesting places in 2019 talk to you soon